everyone. So today we're going to talk about filming educational video with your phone. Because um, we all have a phone in our pocket and a phone that is often very, very capable. Um, and unfortunately, we can't all take advantage of the media services that are around the university. Um, I suppose I should introduce myself first. Um, my name is Timothy Rankin and I'm the manager of the educational media production team here at Italy. Um, so we do this sort of stuff day to day. Um, so we're kind of just aiming to empower people to create their own video footage um, and output their, their, own, their own media um, in those instances where, as I said, you can't access something like the DLU program or the media um, for, from other places. So yeah, empowering people to create their own content. All right. So first of all, I would like to, um, uh, the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners of the custodian, custodianship of lands in which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So what are we going to be talking about today? So um, as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about how to create a video with your smartphone. And they, you know, they, they often say that the, the best camera you have is the one you have in your pocket. And uh, phones nowadays, um, they are incredibly capable of, um, of producing really, really nice video footage. We often laugh here at, and in our, in our um, media team here that we have all these very fancy, expensive cameras that can five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 setups. And you spend all this time setting them up and getting the exposure right and focus on that sort of stuff. When you have someone, you know, who just like just picks up their phone, points it and presses record and it looks really, really nice. So, um, yeah, they're very, very capable. And um, so you can produce some really, really nice stuff. So today we're going to talk through the process of producing a video with your phone, um, mainly focusing on the pre-production. So the planning and the storyboarding and then also the production, the, the actual filming. There's some tips and tricks on how to film effectively uh, with your phone. And um, we'll briefly talk about uh, post-production. Um, we do have other courses running that um, cover that. So we actually have a course running uh, tomorrow on editing. So um, if you haven't jumped onto that, um, you can have a look at the schedule and, and enroll in that. I'll be taking that one as well. Um, so yeah, and also um, there's also a writing uh, course that uh, is offered through Workday and I'll have the, the, the link in here so you can see it. Um, and that's also a bit of a companion as well. So how to actually write effective scripts and storyboards and, and plan out um, uh, shoots for, for educational media. So what do you'll need? So obviously people, um, you'll need some kind of storyboard. Uh, so that is how you start planning your, your production. And uh, people sort of are a little bit unsure what a storyboard is, but a storyboard is kind of a script um, and also um, like a shot list. So, so generating ex sort of what's been spoken and also shot by shot um, how you're going to actually film and what's going to actually appear um, on screen. Um, so, so we'll talk about that. Obviously, you need some kind of phone. And when, when, and when I say phone, I'm, it doesn't have to be top of the line. You know, a lot of phones maybe in the last few years have really, really excellent cameras on them. A lot of them even have um, quite good zoom capabilities as well, really nice in low light. Um, so yeah, you don't have to have a whiz bang phone. And a lot of these skills that I'll talk about here can translate quite well into if you're using say a GoPro as well, or you're gonna be using, maybe you have an SLR or a video camera that you might wanna translate those skills uh, from here using those other kind of devices. Um, editing program. So you need something to actually edit your videos in. Um, so luckily you have access to uh, Adobe Premiere and Adobe Rush. So they come with your um, Adobe Creative Cloud subscriptions. And if you have a Mac, you'll have something like iMovie on there that can edit for free. Um, and also you can get DaVinci Resolve, which is another free video editing program that you can get on Mac and Windows. Um, so yeah, you certainly don't have to pay for any and in video editing software, um, it's all either free or you already have access to it. Um, tomorrow's course that I'm running, um, that is done in Adobe Premiere. And Premiere is, although it's a little bit more uh, complicated than, than other bits of software, um, it is really good because it works really, really nice with the UQ approved branding and and um, and templates, whereas other bits of software don't. So yeah, that's why we've sort of, sort of changed um, from more simpler programs to using Premiere. And obviously you need some creativity and persistence. So obviously that's important. Um, you need to 
you know, start generating ideas about what you want your, your videos to be, what you want to them to, to look like, um, and be persistent. And so, you know, be very diligent in your planning, planning out your shots, um, get, getting your, your your actors and your talent uh, ready and and finding nice locations to film. So, um, yeah, creativity and persistence always pay off. All right. So what is the screen production process? So this is a process that, that we use every day in our production. Um, so um, here at Italy, we create educational media for a wide range of, of courses across the university, across every faculty and every school. Um, so we we use this process every single day in, in producing our material. Um, and so three stages, pre-production, production, and post-production. So pre-production is where you start thinking about the format of your video. So what actually is your video going to look like? What kind of style is it going to have? And then you can think about writing a storyboard. So mapping out what needs to be said, what needs to be seen, how it's going to look, et cetera. Then we talk about um, production. So this is actually going out in the field, filming your video. And um, obviously you need to make sure that you have filming locations locked in, that you have permission to be in that building or that location. Um, also finding people who are comfortable to be in front of camera, that can be quite difficult as well. Um, so we do do uh, coaching as well. So next week there is a course on offer for, for coaching people to, to be in front of a camera. Um, we have a studio here that we, we do a lot of videos, so we do coaching. So it really comes down to getting people comfortable in front of a camera. And, um, and you know, if you have someone who's a bit um, a bit unsure, a bit nervous about being on camera, you know, you do have the options of using things like teleprompters, having the text um, for them to actually just read straight off the text. Um, also encourage them to be a little bit more animated in front of the, the camera. So the way I'm kind of um, here at the moment, I'm kind of moving my hands a lot. I'm talking a lot louder, being a lot more animated. Whereas if I was talking to an individual person, I probably wouldn't be as animated and as um, melodic with my tone. So that's kind of important to when you have people in front of a camera, you need to kind of jazz them up. We use the term U times two, which means you want to sort of jazz them up. They're like twice as much personality coming across. So that's kind of important. And something we'll touch on briefly today, but obviously is important, but is covered in, in other courses, is post-production. So this is, you know, ingesting the files um, into your computer. And, and it's very, very important to have very good file management. So you want to make sure that all your stuff is in a central location um, because unfortunately, you know, if files are missing, particularly video files, if you move, if you rename them, um, and because they're quite large, they don't really work going on to, um, on to, to uh, cloud storage and things like that. Um, that can be quite pro problematic. So it's normally editing quite locally and just having really efficient uh, file, file structures in place. Um, so yeah, editing, exporting and uploading. So exporting is another thing that people get very confused about. What quality do you export your video at? What size do you export your video at? There's all these kind of concerns that um, I'll briefly touch over, but, but more of that in the course that runs tomorrow. All right. So pre-production, planning, and script writing. Now, when I say script writing, this is an in, this inter, is, is kind of interchangeable. You might hear people say script writing. You might people say storyboarding. Um, and so they kind of go hand in hand. Also shot list, you might hear those kind of terms. And they roughly mean roughly the same sort of thing. Um, and essentially, it's, it's planning out um, your particular shot and putting it on, on paper and mapping it out. But before you can plan that and map it out, you've got to decide what kind of video you want to produce. Now, of course, these three video types here, they're not an exhaustive list, of course. There's there's hundreds of different types of uh, uh, video types out there, out there. Like we, we, we have a suite of, I, I haven't even counted, I pro probably should, maybe 20 to 30 or something different kind of video styles that we might produce. And um, these are only just a few. I, I chose these because I thought these might be the main ones uh, that people uh, might be interested in doing. So there's presenting to camera interspersed with video footage or images, or what we call B-roll. Um, so B-roll is when you sort of cut away to another shot that's not the primary person speaking. So um, presenting to camera, so th th this could be someone presenting a, an experiment. So they're talking to camera, 
Um, they're, they're talking through a particular process uh, and then it might cut away to other shots within the same scene. So they might be demonstrating a piece of equipment or, uh, or something else within the scene. Um, or it might just be um, you cutting away to pictures of, of students that, that you filmed or, or, or images of, of, of something else that, that you cut into the edit. The other option is if people are not comfortable being on camera, it might just be video footage or images with voiceover. So you might um, record a PowerPoint presentation or something and you record voiceover for it, or you might film something and then you decide that you'll do a voiceover later on. Um, so that's a really, really good option um, if, if, uh, if a person isn't comfortable on camera and you wanna go down that route. Another thing that um, you may not have thought about in your courses, but is something really, really good to consider are the filming of interviews. So we find that students really, really like hearing real, real world perspectives from people in, in this industry. So that's something we try to do a lot of here at Italy is, uh, is going out and filming um, people in industry, um, uh, other academics, um, interviewing students. Uh, people really appreciate hearing student perspectives on things as well. And so, yeah, we, we find those really, really beneficial to student learning. Something else to consider uh, when you're creating your videos is to try and keep them within a reasonable length. So there's sort of a few schools of thought out there and research done, but um, you know, some people say from you know five to 10 minutes is optimal for this kind of learning videos. We sort of say around about seven to 12. Um, obviously that's, you know, you know, if something needs to be longer, it can be. I mean, I kind of broke my own rule literally in the next slide. The next slide has a video example that I think is 14 or 15 minutes long, um, but keeping it fairly short. And this is important because, you know, students are quite time poor and they have little chunks of time that they can, that they can watch these videos. Um, but if you find that a video you're creating is going to go for like 40 minutes, maybe split it up into smaller chunks that are more easily sort of more watchable by students. So an example of presenting to camera, this is an experiment of someone presenting to camera um, and then it cuts away to shots uh, within the scene. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this reasonably well. ESR or electron spin resonance is a kind of magnetic spectroscopy that can probe the structure of molecules, especially if they have a single unpaired electron. Its diverse uses show up in fields like uh, material physics, chemistry, geology, and even so he talks along and then throughout uh, throughout the video, it's then interspersed with say close ups when he's talking about a particular item, we'll get a bit closer to that shot. There's also interspersed with images uh, that explain um, in a little bit more uh, detail what he's speaking about. Um, and then so just continues to sort of cut back and forth. And that's another really nice uh, way to, to sort of jazz up and make a video more interesting is a lot of people would kind of think just point a camera at someone, press record and they explain something. But it's nice to also just get shots of other things within, um, within the scene that you can focus in on when you are doing, um, doing your, your, your filming, just to break things up a bit. And also... Anna, sorry, I just have someone just, just walk in. Um, we're, we're doing a new video for, for Italy, pr promoting Italy services, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting filmed doing my presentation off to the side here. So, um, so yeah, we'll just ignore. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. He's taking lovely photographs of me. Um, so, so, yeah, so getting in closer to the action is a really, really effective way of sort of breaking up shots as well. And so this, this sort of proceeds in that kind of format. Um, another option is... Oops, sorry, that's the same option, is a uh, voiceover video. So in this particular case, we had someone who was demonstrating a particular um, procedure in a lab. And essentially what we did was we, we went out and we filmed doing that. And then they filmed, uh, sorry, recorded the voiceover at a later time. And this is kind of effective when maybe what the person is, is doing is, um, is difficult for that person to speak about as they're doing it, um, might be unsafe, uh, or they're just not comfortable and they'd rather just de de demonstrate the process and then essentially have a voiceover done at a later time. Um, so yeah, these are really, really effective ways of, uh, of demonstrating quite complex things without the person having to worry about remembering large pieces of, of, of dialogue. So in the low and high level markers, I'll unmute that for a bit. If the level is too low, gently remove the exhaust bottle and fill with tap water. Avoid bending the exhaust hose while removing. So that's another example, All right? Um, so interviews, so there's a few different ways you can do interviews. So um, here at Italy, we do one person interviews and two person interviews. 
And again, this often comes down to whether a person is quite comfortable being in front of the camera or not. Uh, so if, if the interview uh, -er is not so comfortable being on camera, uh, they may choose to just film the responses from the person. So in this case, we had a bit of text pop up with the question, and then we only uh, got the response. Um, so these are a really, really good way of, um, of, of getting the information out, but not having to, to sort of jump back and forth. It also can save time and make the interviews a bit shorter as well, and also makes people who may not be like to be on camera a bit more comfortable. So that's another option for you. And then of course, there's the multicam interview. Um, and I'll talk about um, composition as well a little bit later on, because composition is quite important for these. So it's one thing to just get the camera and focus on something, um, but there is important um, compositional um, things you need to sort of be aware of in order to effectively compose a particular shot to make it look, look nice. So in this particular case, it's a two-sided interview. This did use two cameras, so that's something to consider uh, when you are developing um, your, your material with your phones is, you know, having two cameras versus one camera. Um, obviously, if you have two cameras, it is nice to maybe uh, use um, both the same phone or same kind of phone, because um, if you're mixing kinds of phones, they might give different results, different qualities. Um, so that's another thing to consider. So um, when you've decided on your format, it's time to develop your storyboard. Um, so the storyboard, as I've mentioned, is, is a bit of a, um, a harbour between a script and a shot list. And so a script outlines what is being spoken in the video, and then a shot list outlines what actually will be seen um, in, the, in the footage. So that, that's really, really important to map out exactly what's being said in a video, but also what's happening on screen or, or what, what things you need within the shot. Um, and I'll show you an example in, in a moment. When it comes to interviews, uh, they don't require any kind of storyboard, um, a little bit less planning. It's mainly just a really nice solid set of questions, um, short, sharp, succinct uh, questions um, that um, can be sort of uh, answered in quite a short re relative amount of time because we want to keep them fairly short. And you can advise people you're interviewing to give nice, short, sharp answers. So you're not having to go back and edit, cut out lots and lots of material. All right. Um, the other important thing is when you're you're thinking about developing your, your your script for what you want people to say, is you really want to break it down into really nice small what we call manageable chunks. And what that means is that you don't want a person having to stand in front of a, a camera and be delivering a huge monologue that they may not be able to get through in one go. They might make mistakes, um, or and it's also tiresome. Um, so what, what we tend to we tend to do is when we're looking at storyboards is and scripts, I should say, is that you have small paragraphs of text that they can easily get through in, in one go. And then, you know, the, the next paragraph might be a different kind of shot. It might be a shot of them a little bit further away. Or instead of a shot of them, it might cut to a shot of something else, um, like something else in the scene or, or an image or a PowerPoint slide or whatever. And, and the reason that's really, really good is that if a person does get through their, their, their script and they make a mistake, they've only got a little bit way to go to, 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 to get back to the start. Whereas if they've done a huge monologue and they make a mistake and they don't want to go back to the start, then you're going to have those sort of youtube -y kind of jump cuts that we're probably getting a little bit more used to and they're a little bit more accepted, but, but generally um, they look a little bit weird where a person's speaking and they just jump and quickly cut to, to another section of the video because you've cut out a mistake. So that that's that's quite important. Um, and yeah, oh, sorry, I've got a question, yeah. Yeah, a good question about um, the time you might allow in order to do the pre-production parts. What's, yeah, a, yeah. what's a sensible time frame for that? For, for developing a, a, a storyboard or, or just getting the, the whole thing kind of. Yeah, getting ready to actually start filming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, it all kind of depends how, how complex uh, the actual shoot is. Um, obviously, if it's something like a, um, like a, like a shoot in, in, a, in, a, in a lab, it's going to be much more complex and take longer. Whereas if it's an interview, then it might just um, take a few hours to kind of think about and develop um, the, the kind of questions you might want to ask. You, you'll have to book in spaces. Um, so certainly, I think if it's an interview... I um, mean, it'd probably take only maybe a couple of hours to sort of have a bit of a think about the, the kind of um, questions you want, book in spaces, um, and also, you know, contact the people and wrangle people. 
If it's more of a larger shoot, like you're on location and you're going to be uh, doing a much more complex script, um, that might take several hours because you have to you have to really, really think about exactly what you want the person to say. You have to try and organize the equipment that that's going to be used on set. Um, so that will take many, many more, more, more hours of, of pre-production. And the more sort of organization you do in pre-production, the more smooth the actual production will go. Yeah, it's hard to put an actual official time on it um because it, they, they vary so much but um yeah maybe a couple of hours for a script um for for you know and and, and wrangling a, an interview and for you know several hours for to actually organize mm -hmm. much more complex shoot yeah my experience is the logistics of organizing the location and the human and getting those yes. right <laughs> getting those yeah, calendars to align hard. tends to be the thing that takes the longest so yeah, the exactly earlier right. you start thinking about your talent <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and the with, location, the better. It, I'm it, sure it, many people it, in the room would agree. Exactly right, yeah. And and when it comes to, to interviews as well, it's always good and it's okay to send the questions ahead of time as well um, because you, you may find that the person gets the questions and they're like, I can't actually answer any of these. <laughs> that it's not my area or something like that. So it's always good to sort of send questions beforehand to get a bit of an idea that they can actually answer them. Yeah. Um. So as I said, you know, if you're going to be having someone presenting to camera, you know, try and um, make the dialogue fairly short. Um, and in the in the script or the storyboard, what we also get people to do is indicate the um, the kind of shot that you're actually going to be producing. This is really really handy in planning because there's literally a, like a column in the in the storyboard, and it's the storyboard next. Um, where are we? So there's literally a, a column um, on the on, on the left that says shot type and number, and that allows you to a give that particular shot a number, but also give that shot uh, what we call a shot type, um, and this is the, the the kind of shot that you're actually creating. So, for example, you know you generally might start off a piece of video of someone presenting. Um, they might be like like a close up, and it's a close up of them speaking and talking through something, and then you might in the next shot for shot number two. Um, you might cut to like a half shot, which might be half their body to the top of their head. Um, and then you indicate in the script section what they're speaking for that particular shot. And then shot three, um, if it's say uh, maybe cutting to an image, we would indicate that with FS or full screen. And again, in the script area, you would have what they're saying for, for that particular time where that um, that full screen graphic is on the screen. So so breaking those um, those um, dialogue up into separate shots really, really helps with, with A, making the shots more interesting, um, but also, um, you know, making the dialogue quite short. Um, so this is a bit of an example of the kind of shots that, that you might use. Um, you know, things like extreme long shots and long shots, and you can see the little, little abbreviations, LS, XLS, VLS, they're really good for establishing scenes. So you might be establishing your first shot might be establishing the building you're in or, or a pan of the lab or something like that. And then you might cut to a close up or a mid shot of of a person speaking, and then you might cut to to full screen shots of of um of of your uh, of of like a full screen slide in PowerPoint or, or whatever. So it really depends on what kind of shooting situation you are. If you're in if you're in a lab and you want to see all the equipment, you might start off with more of a longer shot, and then as it progresses, you're getting closer to, to the action. But if there's nothing in the shot. Um, that you need to focus in on or anything like that and the surroundings of, of where you're filming doesn't matter, you might start off with more of a close-up or a mid-shot and focus on the person speaking. And um, so in terms of an actual example of, of a bit of a script, so I've got a script here from, so we do a lot of studio videos here where people come into our studio and film and it's very similar to, to other kind of shoots where you have a column where you identify what kind of shot it is, close up, and then you literally see for that close up, they said one sentence. Very easy to get through, very short and sharp. And then you expand on that information a little bit more um, with, say, a full screen slide where you then, in this last column, this last column is really good for putting in imagery or, or objects that you might be having on screen as that person's speaking. So, the, in this example, it's a uh, 
The reason it's got PowerPoint slides here is because these are a PowerPoint presentation that a person actually stands in front of and presents in front of the image. So that's why you've seen that, that image. But um, this could be just, you could just do a cartoon drawing or just get an image off the internet of just a person's head to indicate that's the kind of close-up you, you're going to want. Or you could use that column to to you know, just put in pictures of the location that you might want the person to be standing in. So you can use that last column for, for, for planning your, your, your shots, or in this case, actually putting the actual um, images that are going to be used. And you'll see here in these blocks here that you know, there's not much spoken in, in that bit there. The person can get through it quite easily. Um, this, again, that's one shot. That person can get through that quite easily. So um, it's just a matter of just breaking things up into nice, easily um, speakable chunks, which is, which is handy. And I'll provide this storyboard template to everyone as well at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. Sorry, I just need to have a, a swig. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we do offer a writing educational media course so that's available in Workday. Um, so when when I, I'll send through these slides, you'll be able to click on um, click on that link and enroll in in that. And essentially, it sort of takes you through how to um, create storyboards and things like that um, uh, for uh, creating educational media and, and and how to structure things. So uh, much more detailed than I went into. Um, it does have a bit of a focus more on studio re recording and recording on your desktop, but. Um, Definitely the, the skills in there that relate to to creating a script and storyboarding and stuff works across, um, you know, a variety of different kinds of, of media that you can produce. So production. So once you've actually decided what kind of video you're going to produce, you've got a bit of a storyboard together, you've got your script, you, you know where you're, you're going to, um, you've got a bit of an idea of who you're going to film and where you're going to film it. Um, probably... One of the first things you need to do is set up your phone. Um, so I'll talk about um, the setup for iPhone and Android. Now, um, the nice thing about iPhones is they tend to have a very similar, well, they do, they have the same settings across all, all devices. Um, Android, they tend to have, there might be some, a few changes here and there depending on, on the, the model that you have, um, but I can just sort of go guide you in, in the, the general kind of settings that you might want to, you might want to use. Um, so, you know, we tend to, to recommend people using their phones to set it to, um, well, yeah, it's, it, this is, this is, a, this is a sort of a hard one because you also have to decide, um, what you're wanting to do with the, the footage before you kind of think about, um, what size of the, the, the video and what I mean size, I mean, pixel size, like, you know, is it going to be high definition? Is it going to be 4k? Um, so you need to have a bit of a think about that. Um, in most cases, just re recording at a 1080p HD 30, which is probably a setting you've seen in your phones before. It means the video is going to be a full HD video, which is the vast majority of videos that you sort of watch on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and what we call 30 frames per second. So that's the amount of images per second generated to, to generate the video. Now, um, 30 frames per second is sort of one of the more commonly used frame rates that are more compatible with um, videos you might get um, from, from the stock video sources, uh, videos you, you might record from your screen on your computer. Um, so that's why we tend, tend to sort of um, steer people to, towards that. Um, but the, the other option is you can record in 4K. Now, 4K is good for a few reasons. Now, obviously, you're getting more resolution, so you kind of are getting a bit of a nice high-quality picture. Um, but the nice thing about uh, filming in 4K is something called 4K punch-in, which I'll, I'll give an example in, in a moment. What 4K punch-in allows you to do is it allows you to effectively um, almost feel like you've got two cameras. So you can set up your phone and you can record in 4K. And then when you're editing, you can actually edit in a lower resolution timeline. So you can edit in a, a high definition timeline. But what's nice about that is when you bring in a really high res video into a lower resolution timeline, essentially you can zoom that footage in without losing any quality. Um, so that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis with all our videos is that we record in 4K and then to break up the shot, we will then just simply zoom in while we're editing and we're not losing quality because of the, the, the high resolution of our footage. So that's something you, you need to consider. If your, your phone may not do 4K, and most do nowadays, um, or you may not have the space to film 4K, so that might be a limitation. Um, but 4K is really, really good option for, for, for punching in later on, making it look like you've got multiple cameras. 
The other thing to consider is that, you know, if there's any parts of your video that you might want to be slow motion, um, you can record those at 60 frames per second. That just means you're getting more images per second. And that means that you can actually slow that down to half, which will be 30, which means you get that really nice, smooth, slow motion. Um, but of course, phones also have like, you know, 240 or, or, or more uh, slow motion um, setting if you really want to go down that route of really slow motion. Um, but sometimes, you know, just, just halving it from 60 to 30 is enough. Also, in terms of, of video size, um, it's also always good to maybe tick the box for high efficiency on your phones. Um, it just means that your, your file will be a little bit more smaller in file size and still quite good quality. Um, and it's still compatible with, because you've got an option here, most compatible and high efficiency. But really, um, this high efficiency file format it is quite widely acceptable by most of the video editors. So you shouldn't have any dramas. The rules are generally the same with, with setting up an Android phone. It's just they might look a little bit different. You know, instead of saying 1080p, and 1080p is, just means that the video is, is not 1,920 pixels wide by 1,080 pixels high, that that's what that means. Full HD is another word for it. Um, and so, yeah, on an Android device, it'll be sort of listed like that. Again, if you can shoot 4K, that's always a great option. Setting stabilization on is great because it'll smooth out your footage. And again, um, reduce file size is a little bit like the high efficiency option on iPhone as well. So as I mentioned with the 4K. Tim, sorry. Oh, sorry, you got a question? We have another good question about storage space. Yep. And how do you recommend uh, an appropriate, how much storage space you might need on your phone to do this kind of filming? Uh, yeah, so the, the nice thing about iPhone is, um, and I don't know if it came up here, is that it actually has, yeah, so there you go. So a minute of video in, so if you're doing 4K at 30 frames per second, it's uh, 170 megabytes um, per minute. So essentially you just need to sort of work out if you're going to be filming for an hour, 170 megabytes times 660, and then you got to see how many gig that's going to take up on your on your phone. Um, so yeah, you can use that as a bit of a rough guide to sort of see how, how much space your video might take. Um, it is very easy to, to fill up phones quite fast, um, but nowadays phones have got quite a heck of a lot of storage. Um, so yeah, it's just a matter of just, just checking in with that. And you, you can use that as a bit of a guide, I think. Yeah. So um, shooting 4K, so as you can see, 4K is, is you know, in, in yellow there is much bit bigger than, than than full HD, and that kind of really means that you can sort of sort of sort of see here if you have a a four K piece of video um, that you put into a full HD timeline, you can literally take that little section there and make it look like you're zooming in. And the example is on the next slide, whereby if I just record in a normal HD piece of video, the video looks beautiful. But if I zoom that in, and I'm actually working in a in a, a full HD project, um, you know, zooming in is going to look pixelated. It's not going to look very nice. But if I'm working on a on a um, a full HD timeline, again, the 4K for footage when it's when it's squished down in, in to to sort of fit, it's still going to look beautiful. It's going to look as beautiful as 1080. Um, but the ability is then you can actually zoom that footage out um, to get. Uh, a really, really nice close-up. So you can break up shots without having multiple cameras. So really, really handy. So shooting your footage. Um, you know, it goes without saying that if, if you're wanting to shoot a piece of footage, try and find the quietest place you can, which is much light as possible. Because I have to understand that a lot of people might not be able to get access to Bluetooth microphones. They might not be able to get access to good lighting. Um, so it's important to find the right location for your shoot. Um, we tend to steer people away from, you know, shooting um, in front of windows and such. Uh, windows that have like those partially block out blinds are really, really beautiful because they give you kind of the, the look of a window, but they don't, you don't get that real overexposure of the, of, of the background. Um, so if you have a window like that, that's really, really good. A lot of offices at UQ do that. Um, but if you don't, then maybe just moving the presenter to the other side of the room where you have that natural light coming in directly on them, that can work really, really well. Um, and in terms of finding the, the quietest place, this comes down to what you're filming. If you're filming an interview, obviously you want it to be in a very quiet place. Um, boardrooms are really nice. Um, but also things in context can work as well. If you're filming in a, in in a busy area and 
you know, it's expected that it's busy and it's expected that there's going to be noise, then people are going to be fine with that. But if you're filming in in a boardroom that's quite quiet and then you're hearing people chatter in the background, that's going to be like, oh, that doesn't sound right. So it all depends. And also if you're filming in a lab, it's expected to be loud if it's a lab. So that's fine. And so getting, if you don't have a microphone, you can get as close to the subject as possible while, while getting the vital elements in. Phones have quite good microphones. They often have microphones on both sides, on, on the front and back. Um, or you can go down the route of getting some kind of Bluetooth microphone that might plug in to, to the bottom of it and, and Bluetooth, and you can just clip it on to, to the subject. They're getting actually quite cheap, and you can just look up online for, for Bluetooth um, uh, wireless microphones for, for phones. Um, always holding the landscape. Um, this is always one of the, the, those rules is always hold landscape because if you, if you record in, in portrait, doesn't translate well um, to video and also trying to zoom that up and, and stuff is, is not really going to work very well. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, th th this next point sort of de depends on the subject matter, but, you know, sometimes it is nice to start off with a bit of a wider shot, establishing shot so you can see what's kind of in the scene. Um, like that example I showed in, in the lab, um, and then you sort of can cut in a little bit closer to show individual shots um, as well. Um, and again, if you don't have two cameras, you can do the 4K punch in. That's a really good way around having two cameras. But if you have access to two cameras, you might have one on the subject and then you might have another one that's maybe roaming around, literally just holding it, recording it and moving it around, getting closer to what the person is talking about. Yeah. And also just remember when, when you're cutting, you're shooting cutaway shots. So cutaway shots are the kind of shots that um, you just sort of in, in, intersperse amongst your footage. So someone might be talking and then you intersperse cutaway shots in that. Um, yeah, it's always good to maybe just make sure you're, you're not speaking over the top of that because sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of the background noise happening um, as well. Like if you're filming a cafe, um, it's funny how many sort of times you'll be filming a cafe and then you you forget that you're having a chat with someone or you're on the phone and you can hear it in the background when you really, really wanted the cafe sound. Um, so sort of be careful of that as well. So when you're, if you have someone who's presenting to camera, um, it's always good to kind of keep track of, of, um, of the shot you're taking and also indicate in the footage that um, a shot's about to start. So really, really good way of that is when you've got your your storyboard, it'll have all those shot numbers. Is you know, you know, you press record. You say this is this is shot three, and action. And then the person should wait around about two to three seconds before speaking. And the reason we do that is just so it's a little bit of room to kind of cut around. You don't want a person as soon as it says action to start speaking straight away, because you want that kind of few seconds before they start speaking to 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 sort of speak around <clears throat> sorry i'm losing my voice already wow i'm out of practice um the other so another really, really good good way of getting people um more comfortable on camera and not having to memorize is using a teleprompter though when most people think of a teleprompter they think of or well, kind of what what's here is a, a camera with an ipad or something on it or or like a big setup where they have a camera and it has the glass in front of the lens and it's projecting the the text onto the lens um, they're really, really helpful, but you can do them in a really bodgy way. So you can literally have your phone, um, and you can have another phone above it with the text scrolling on it or an iPad directly above the lens of, of the camera, or you can set up your phone and maybe have a laptop near it. Um, and you scroll the text on your laptop. Um, or there are some apps where you can actually record, you can actually use the front facing camera and have the script scrolling using the front facing camera. So you don't have to have a separate device, which is, which is quite handy. So um, yeah, it's, it's always good to have some sort of script if possible that people can read off, but understand that sometimes that's not possible if they're doing some kind of procedure in a lab or something and they're simply not able to concentrate on, on reading a script. Um, so that's something you need to need to be sort of considerate of. You are going to get go down the route of a teleprompter and you're going to have like a script above the lens. Um, yeah, make sure it's above. Don't put the script beside or below. Um, and it's it's good if it's on a digital device so you can have the text quite large and then scroll through it, which, which, which is quite important. Yeah. And also ticking off your shots as you do them is important so you can you can keep track of things. And obviously encourage your participants to be far more animated than they normally would be um, in their day-to-day -day lives. 
So shooting your footage, it, it's it's important to try and avoid shaky footage. You know, this can be avoided with using a gimbal or something like that. So gimbals are quite cheap now um, that you lock your phone into and you and you hold it and it stay it stays quite stable. Or maybe some kind of, um, of of tripod that you can sit it on as well. And some tripods now have lights built into them. You can go to Kmart and get it for 20, 30 bucks, pretty cheap now. Um, and so that's a really good way to, con to sort of reduce the shakiness in your footage. Also, um, when you're composing your shots and you're moving your camera around, you can use that to your benefit. So if you're doing a video where it might just be um, something that's a little bit more relaxed video, Botanical gardens, hotel shops, uh, something a bit more relaxed, and your your movements of your camera might be a little bit more slow. So if you're handheld with a gimbal or you're holding it steady with your body, um, the shots might tend to be a little bit more slow. But if you're talking about the inner city and and the buzz of 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 society and 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 stuff in, in the city, then you might be a little bit more fast with your movements of your camera, really quick pans, and make it a little bit more dynamic. So you can just kind of suit the movement of your camera to the type of um, to the type of shoot that, that, that you're doing. Um, and also when you're out on a shoot, try and get your vital shots first um, because um, if you're running out of time, it's important to get all the really, really important shots first. And then maybe there's some nice to have shots to have later on, um, which, which is, is kind of, um, you know, if you don't get those, then it's not a big deal. Yeah. And also, you know, try to avoid taking really, really long takes as well. It, it's, it's nice again to sort of sort of chunk up the, the footage so you're not having quite long, long takes. Um, but, but, but of course, that, that depends on the actual shoot. If you've got a person demonstrating something and they're standing there for a long period of time, um, then, yeah, you might just press record for the whole entire time. Or, you know, if a person makes a mistake, you might choose to stop and then start it again, just so you're not having to have really, really long videos that you have to go through and, and try and find your individual clips. And always check your footage before you leave a shoot to make sure that it's actually worked. Um, obviously, you know, if you're filming in public, um, you can film in public places. Um, just be mindful that some people may not like to be on camera. Um, if a person is kind of the, the main focus of, of what you're recording, um, or they, or they're going to be speaking, um, then obviously you need to get some kind of permission from them and you can get written permission. UQ has uh, written photography and video consent forms. Um, and also, you know, wherever you're f f filming, you know, if it's on private land and often in public buildings, even though some public buildings you can film in, it's always good to just talk to security and say, you're wanting to film in here or whatever, just in case you might get in trouble. And so the other thing is you can always consult the, um, um, I've got, I'll have this, this, um, this link here for you to have a look at. There's information on, on, um, on OMC uh, marketing communications about, about that. So you'll be able to read this information and get your head across um, what you can and can't do. So um, I'll, quick, I'll talk about uh, composition. So composition is quite important when you're, you're filming your, your videos. Um, things like headroom. So just having enough headroom above a subject. So you never want to have them kind of their head too close to the top of the frame or have it chopped off. Generally, the closer they are, you can have a little bit less headroom. Um, and so the further away, the more headroom you have. Um, and, you know, depending on whether you want to center the person or have them off to the side kind of depends on the subject matter. It's in, it's entirely fine to sort of use at your discretion. Um, it's obviously always good to keep the person at eye line level so you don't have the camera too low or too high. Um, and so that always, um, you know, it sort of it makes them feel like they're more on your level or if it's low, they seem more dominating. If the camera's too high, they might seem a little bit more submissive. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's important to keep the camera nice and eye line with your subject, um, and uh, and also um, you know you 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 want to sort of um, have the person locking eyes onto the camera as much time as possible, unless they're of course referring to something within the shot. Um, so trying to keep that eye contact with uh, with the um, with the camera as much as possible is good. That's with presenting to camera interviews. They're a bit different. So interviews, you don't look at the camera. Um, maybe if you're going to be doing a quick introduction to I'm I'm here with blah, 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 we're going to talk about blah, 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 you might look at the camera first. But generally, you sort of have them sort of um, positioned like this, using what we call the rule of thirds. So you tend to have that person sort of sitting in that in that sort of um, in that quadrant there, the intersection of those quadrants. Um, and so it, it also allows for a little bit of headroom, a little bit of looking space. So looking space is this area in front of the person as well. 
Um, so it gives them space to kind of look like they have they have sort of room to breathe and and and, and room to speak, whereas if they were over here looking that way, it wouldn't look great. Um, and so with interviews, yeah, you tend to uh, avoid looking at the camera unless you're doing some kind of some kind of introduction. And again, just making sure you have some kind of headroom. And the nice thing about if you do shoot 4K um, with we uh, with interviews is that if someone's do, having a response and they make a mistake, um, then you can use that 4K punch in to get a little bit closer and sort of bridge that mistake so you can cut that out in in editing. So um, yeah. Um, they're very sort of much more versatile if you have a 4K camera. Um, but look, you know, you might decide that for one question, if you only got one camera, you don't have 4K, one question you might record further away. The next question you might record a little bit closer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all up to you and what kind of equipment you have. Um, the next thing to sort of talk about a voiceover. So if you're doing a kind of presentation where you're, uh, you're not wanting to speak in, in the field, you're wanting to do a, a voiceover at a later time. Um, you know, m a lot of microphones on um, on devices now are really, really good. So even, even you know, microphones on your laptops nowadays are, are pretty good. Uh, microphones phones on, on your, your phones are really good. Um, it's just a matter of sort of trying to find an area that um, is a little bit what we call like a dead space, uh, which means there's not much echo, not much reverberation. This room I'm in here is all padded around the edge. It's all it's it's a padded room and it feels a bit weird on your ears, but it's quite dead. So places that have like curtains on the wall and things like that um, work really well, but sort of hard surfaces tend to re reverberate. So one tip is you know you can put a doona over your head and record your voiceover, whether that be on your laptop um, or you might have a nice podcaster microphone, um, like a USB microphone plugged into your computer um, that, that, you, that you can use. Generally, they work well sort of outside of, um, in, you may, don't really need padded rooms or anything fancy for those, but it's sort of the more smaller microphones, maybe on your phones as well, that you might want to hop under a doona with your script and, and record it. Um, and yeah, so phones are great. You just, um, uh, you know, I'd probably suggest instead of using like the voice memo app is maybe actually just record just blank video and just take the, the audio from that um, in, instead. Um, and again, you know, it's just a matter of when you are presenting voiceovers to have that sort of confident melodic tone and good projection. Um, so you may want to uh, source images and videos for your um, for your your productions. You may not be able to source them um, yourself. You may not be able to film them yourself. So you do have access to Adobe Stock that has video um, and imagery that you can use in your productions. Um, you also uh, need need to be aware that. Um, that uh, a lot of them are paid, but there is a free section of videos. It's a little bit hard to find. You, you could go into, into the filters and find the free videos in Adobe stock. Um, but yeah, there, there are quite a lot of other sort of um, um, outlets out there for getting free Im images and videos. And as long as you, at, in your videos, you reference them appropriately, um, then, then, then that's, that's, that's good. I mean, um, well, what we can't, can't kind of say is that if you are using images that are from these kind of stock photography sites, you don't generally need to attribute each individual image. You just need to have some kind of message at the end saying that the images used in this video are from Adobe Stock. And if there's any images that are not, um, that are in your production, then you might be able to list them separately uh, uh, under that. One thing that is evolving um, is the AI generated imagery. Um, so this is an evolving space and something that is changing all the time. Um, and we've kind of gone a little bit down the rabbit hole on, on what you can and can't use in your productions at UQ um, in terms of AI generated imagery. Um, and we've kind of come away with a bit of a guide. This is kind of um, a collection of, of what is a good practice at the moment and also what the university um, likes. Um, but generally, they like to steer away from the use of AI-generated people or hero people. So, so it's the images of that feature a person predominantly, avoiding that if possible. Um, but there is an exception to that. You know, if if you if you need and it's crucial to teaching, you need to generate an image of a person in a particular situation that you cannot film yourself or you can't get online. Um, then you can generate that in AI, but it needs to be, you know, said that that image needs to be as accurate and as realistic looking as possible. Um, you know, we don't want extra fingers, extra arms, et cetera, it needs to be as real as possible. Um, also, an interview where you don't want to use AI to alter the image of a person as well. Um, so if you have an image of a, of a person or a hero image, you don't want to be using AI to alter that beyond recognition. Um, 
But in terms of what you are generally free to do is use AI imagery for scientific and abstract purposes. So, you know, if you needed a, an image of a dice and you couldn't find a nice one, you know, you can use, um, you can use AI to, to, to generate that. Um, and so, and, you know, if you need an image of a, of a molecule and it, you, you generate that, and obviously just making sure it is the correct molecule looks right. Obviously, there are copyright issues around that. You don't own anything. The university doesn't own anything that is created through the AI-generated imagery. The larger production that that AI-generated image exists in um, is copywritten, um, but uh, the actual individual elements within um, the images aren't. And obviously, referencing them, the, the, them appropriately. So um, you need to indicate within your productions uh, when something has been generated. Um, and so that can be done. If it's an Adobe stock, we're generally saying, you know, just put Adobe stock generated with AI near the image. Um, if it's something that you generated in another AI generated a generative program, put the actual prompt um, and, and what platform you used near that particular image as well. And obviously just use good judgment, avoid, you know, generating culturally sensitive imagery and just things that, things that don't feel right to be generated, you probably shouldn't be generating. All right. So, um, the very last thing I want to talk about, um, and I'll talk about this briefly, just because um, it's it's covered in in the course I'll be taking, I'll be doing tomorrow, is the editing process. So essentially, taking all your footage from your devices, bringing it into the computer, um, and editing it. Now, of course, you, you can edit on device. So if you're filming with an iPad, for example, you can edit um, on the device, um, which which might save you time than trying to transfer it. Um, but yeah. Most computers nowadays are pretty capable of handling um, some sort of video editor, um, and there's quite a lot of options out there. Um, I think you know there's one built into Windows. There always sort of has been Adobe Rush, with you which you have access to, DaVinci Resolve, which is free to download, and iMovie, which is built into Mac OS. Um, and the nice thing about all video editing software, even if you just learn one, is those skills translate really, really well across across all of them. They really are importing files, arranging them exporting and exporting at the correct that the correct kind of quality um, so file management is incredibly important you know um, and you know trying to send files wirelessly from your phone to the computer can be problematic so always try and plug in and get your your files directly off the device that way because you're going to be dealing with quite large files and transferring over the air sometimes can be problematic keeping everything in one nice folder because if you start moving stuff around or renaming files um, the, the software can lose track of that quite easily and can freak out. Um, and obviously when you are um, editing your videos, make sure you're using UQ approved video templates. Um, the UQ digital asset management uh, platform has a lot of the UQ video templates that you can use. Um, and if you, if you do the, the course tomorrow, um, I'll be actually sending out um, that, that template. Um, but I can, I can provide the, it, it to you as well. If, if, if anyone's interested in, in, in investigating using a UQ approved template, um, I can send that to you as well. Just, just flick me an email and reach out. Um, and yeah, and most video editors have really, really nice export process, presets. And they're essentially presets that relate to the quality of the video that's going to be exported from the um, program in terms of how large it's going to be in terms of physical size, file size, and making it compatible with quite a wide range of, um, of uh, learning platforms, whether it be on YouTube or, or, or Blackboard or wherever. Um, so that's me. Uh, that, that's my email address. If anyone wants to reach out for any advice, and I'll send this, um, the, the, this, uh, this slide deck out after the presentation. Um, but we've got a few more minutes and I was just wondering you know, if anyone had any questions, were there any questions in the chat that, that were particularly, um, needed me to, 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 to jump on? I've, um, I've also launched the, the evaluation poll if anyone wants to give any feedback. Um, Tim, there was a question about any apps in particular you recommend for screen reader. I think the, some Emma's answered that question, but if there is an app that you recommend off the top of your head, that was the only other question so far. A, um, as, as in like, 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 like a teleprompt program. Yeah. Teleprompter. Sorry. Correct. Um, what's the one we use? We've, we, we used, oh, it's an app on the iPad to, like teleprompter plus or I'll have to look into it because I can't remember the name. I know what the icon looks like and everything, but can't remember the name. <laughs> um, yeah, what was the one, one you recommended, Emma? Um, uh, there's teleprompter, which is the free one, and then teleprompter pro, 
Um, I think I that's the one I'm thinking uh, of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. just a simple, nice, simple one that's not yeah. cluttered with with features. It just works yeah. nicely. Yeah. And and there's another one out there that um, again I can't remember the name of, but it it would be searchable. Is the one where um, you can just flip the camera around and 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 read it as it's scrolling. Teleprompter Pro probably has that built in anyway, but there, there's some other ones out there that um, instead of you know trying to have a separate device with the teleprompter on there above your above your camera, um, you can just use the front facing camera and literally read as you're recording. Um, but be aware the front facing cameras on phones aren't as good as the, the back ones. Yeah, and may, may not be able to get you 4K as well. So. And then, Tim, there's just one final question around generating transcripts. Yep. Um, yep. If you want to answer that, or maybe that's something you'll cover tomorrow. Um, so so transcripts, obviously, we, we need to make stuff incredibly accessible. That's one of the very important things that we need to do at UQ. Um, so there's a few ways to generate transcripts. One way is um, if you have a script for your video already, um, um, so Bla uh, Blackboard, that upload does have a facility to upload um, transcripts into that. I don't, it doesn't let you sync it. Oh, yes, it does. It does. So I, I think you can use it to, um, to, to sort of, to put your, your, your transcript up there. Also, YouTube is really good for it. So you can, if you're uploading stuff to YouTube, what you can do is you can literally just paste your script into YouTube and it'll sync it up with the video, um, which is really, really handy. Um, and if you don't have any kind of script generated and it was just something that was um, spoken off the top of someone's head, um, then uh, Premiere has really good auto-generated captions. Uh, so you can actually, uh, in, in your timeline, and I can talk about this tomorrow, is, um, is you can generate a transcript based on that. Um, but, but most platforms we have here, um, they can either accept a transcript that you generate um, or, or one that's, you know, um, or you just paste in the actual text and it'll sync it up. Yeah. And also you, you, YouTube does automatic ones as well, but it's not as nice. It doesn't have as many punctuation and capitals, that kind of stuff in it, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, we might wrap it up there. So um, thank you very much for everyone for, um, for attending. I'll, um, I'll shoot an email out to everyone that attended.